Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, NPTEL course on Mechanical Behavior of Materials. Uh, today we will move on to a new topic um, called uh, Plastic Deformation. If you recall what all we have seen so far, uh, you will agree with me that uh, we dealt with subjects which, uh, which are mostly uh, described by theory of elasticity. Right? Uh, if you look at uh, from the uh, fundamental perspectives as well as the, the core theory and the description of elastic properties and elastic uh, stress strain relations and then the description of dislocations and energy, stress fields and everything and so on. So we extensively used elasticity. So now we'll move on to uh, plastic deformation. So that means we need to get into the theory of plasticity. We will have some introductory aspects of theory of plasticity. We will not get into the, the core idea because uh, our intention here is to just get the concept in describing the yielding phenomenon in a polycrystalline materials. And of course, we'll see how we can extend this uh, idea of the yield phenomenon or yield criteria or theory of yielding to different kinds of materials. So that is our intention to get into this theory of plasticity. So if you look at this, uh, the kind of uh, situations we have in the uh, engineering uh, environment, the engineering components may be subjected to complex loading in tension, compression, bending, torsion, pressure, or combinations of these. Okay, so you all will agree that uh, this is the, the case in reality. Most of the components, especially in an engineering application structures, they, they are all subjected to different complex loading. Okay, it could be a combinations of or tension tension or tension compression or bending torsion simply pressures or any one of the combinations of these two okay so that the a given point in the material stresses often occur in more than one direction you see we have now looked at uh, uh, some of the very basic definition of stress at a point stress in a direction like that and now we also looked at uh, three dimensional state of stress and you know biaxial stress triaxial stress and so on but in reality uh, we, we we exactly seeing the uh, similar complex combinations of uh, stresses in uh, in a day to day life so if sufficiently severe such combined stresses can act together to cause the material to yield or fracture okay so such a complex type of stresses or loading can lead to either the material uh, will yield or fracture so we are introducing two words here yield and fracture okay predicting the safe limits for use of a material under combined stresses requires the application of failure criterion so every one of us uh, want to avoid failure okay so in an engineering situation this is very very important in terms of you know safety and uh, economy and so on so you need to know the failure criterion on what basis we will you know apply load on the structural members so this there should be some guidelines otherwise there could be some uh, failures uh, i mean unexpected failures sudden failures and so on right so the predicting the safe limits is uh, is the primary concern here and that is what uh, we are going to look at it a number of different failure criteria are available some of which predict failure by yielding others failure by fracture so we are talking about two different things either your material can yield and or fracture 
So yield is better than fracture because uh, you know fracture is complete total failure. Yield is a partial failure. That is kind of a warning, right? Yielding is kind of a warning, warning signal. So the former are specifically called yield criteria. The latter is fracture criteria. So we are looking at two different uh, criterion here, yield criteria and fracture criteria. Here, the failure criteria will be considered on the basis of values of stress. So, so we know what is uh, stress now and we have sufficient background to understand the word stress. So, this failure criterion will be given in terms of stress. Okay. We are not talking about a load here. We are talking about a stress. So, please uh, uh, pay attention to this uh, details. Okay. Their application involves calculating an effective value of stress that characterizes the combined stresses and then this value is compared with the yield or fracture strength of the material. So what does it mean is uh, you, you try to come to a, a safe limit of a stresses by some prediction or calculation and then compare that value with the what is the experimental value reported or determined in our end. Then these two values com values be compared and then you can take a decision. A given material may fail by either by yielding or fracture depending upon its properties and the state of stress so that in general the possibility of either event occurring first must be considered. So it is not that uh, uh, we want to reach the fracture of the material. It can be uh, the prediction can just lead to yield point or fracture point. So yield and fracture need not be this, uh, the final goal because it depends primarily on the material property. Not, not necessarily all the material will uh, exhibit yield, right? Only ductile materials will exhibit yield, not the uh, brittle materials will exhibit sufficient yield. Okay. So um, we will now look at the uh, yield criterion. The need for a failure criteria. Why do we need this criterion? Okay. So you look at this. Uh, schematic shown here. What is shown here is uh, a cube which is subjected to uniaxial uh, tension and uh, this is the, the stress strain curve for this. So the assumption here is the material is assumed to be a ductile engineering material. The behavior of which approximates the ideal elastic, perfectly plastic case. So it is just for our own consideration. Okay, a ductile material will which exhibits ideal elastic. That means it's just elastic behavior, and then perfect plastic. Okay, please understand this. This is for our own understanding. Just for assumption. In reality, there is nothing like this. Right? You all know that. But what is that we are seeing now? We are seeing that elastic and then plastic. That means we are getting some value here, sigma naught, that is a yield stress, right? Now, in the same geometry, we will subject them to different type of loading here. That's what's shown here. Suppose if the load is not only applied in unidirectional, but one direction of the stress is reversed or a transfer stress. What happens to the sigma naught? That is the idea. So what is that we are seeing here? It's quite interesting, right? The moment you change the state of stress, you see that accordingly the Young's modulus is also getting modified. This we know. This we have background to understand this. But what happens to the sigma naught? Sigma naught becomes, that is sigma y is approximately becomes half. This is very important to note. Okay. So the sigma, when the sigma x becomes uh, minus sigma y, then the yield stress is becoming 
nearly half of the value as compared to the uniaxial tensile force. The third one, what you are seeing here is, it is a biaxial tension, right? What you are seeing is biaxial tension, sigma x is equal to sigma y. And what is that we are seeing here? Surprisingly, there is no change in the yield stress. Sigma y is equal to approximately equal to sigma naught. Okay. So looking at the previous experience, uh, one would have expected some uh, change, whether it could have increased the strength or decreased the strength, but nothing has happened, fortunately, right? So this is uh, quite uh, surprising. And then finally, what will happen if you subject this component to a hydrostatic stress? That means you know the meaning of hydrostatic stress now. That means sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z will be of equal magnitude and um, in compression. That's why it is minus p. So what happens? Quite interestingly, okay, it's a very a linear behavior. The material doesn't yield. Okay, one important point you have to remember here is in all these A, B, C can be experimentally verified by some means. We have a means of doing this, but we cannot create a hydrostatic pressure and then, uh, I mean, in a simple experiments, we cannot realize this. So, nevertheless, this is what it is uh, shown here. There's nothing happens to this material, right? You recall that, you know, I, in previous elasticity theory also, we have seen that hydrostatic stress doesn't contribute to lasting deformation. Okay, that also you should remember. So what we are we have seen here is the yield strength for a ductile metal under various state of stresses, uh, namely uniaxial tension, tension with a transverse compression, biaxial tension, and hydrostatic compression. You see that different different type of state of stresses or type of stresses, the material exhibits a different behavior in terms of yielding. And now you see the question, what is the need for this failure criteria? So the answer comes from this experiments, right? So unless we have this number, the failure criterion, uh, norm, namely yield or fracture criterion, we do not know how this material is going to respond when the stress is raised to the higher level. So that is the uh, you know core idea of looking at the uh, failure criteria or the need for the failure criteria. Okay. So now we look at uh, how do we go about this. Failure criteria for isotropic material can be expressed in the mathematical form. That is. Uh, f of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 is equal to sigma c at failure. So what is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3? You all know the principal stresses. So the principal stresses, a function which is, uh, you know, uh, depends on this pr principal stresses should predict some critical stress, sigma c. Okay. In terms of, the, you, we are interested in calculating the critical stress in terms of principal stresses, which we already know. So that is the idea. So where failure, yielding or fracture is predicted to occur when a specific mathematical function f of the principal normal stresses is equal to failure strength of the material, sigma c, as from the uniaxial test. Yes, this is very important. So you know what is uh, critical stress. That is not important whether you can relate that quantity with a common test. What is the common test we do? We do a simple uniaxial test, whether we can find out uh, or the critical stress, whatever the yield theory is predicting, whether we can relate that quantity with the what we already are, we are able to do it with the uniaxial tension test. That is the question. The failure strength is either the yield strength sigma naught or the ultimate strength sigma ut or uc depending upon whether the yielding or fracture is of interest. 
So here, depending upon the interest, we, we can relate not just to yield strength, that is the another term now, ultimate strength, ultimate strength. This also we will see uh, when we look at the mechanical testing uh, syllabus. But this is uh, uh, another term which normally uh, one can estimate in the simple tensile test. And this is sigma uc is a fracture strength. Okay, at the, at the time of fracture, what is the stress? The a requirement for a valid failure criterion is that it must give same result regardless of the original choice of the coordinate system in a problem. This is important. Okay. This requirement is met if the criterion can be expressed in terms of principal stresses. So only when you express the fail, failure criterion or yield criterion in terms of principal stresses, then you don't have to worry about whether it is represented in the uh, different different coordinate forms. It is also met by any criterion where f is the mathematical function of one or more of the stress variance. Okay. If any particular case of the above equation, that is the f is equal to sigma c, is plotted in a principal normal stress space, that means it is in a three dimensional coordinates of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, the function forms a surface that is called failure surface. So, if you have this uh, values sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, that means the mathematical function predicts the critical in all these three uh, stresses. Then we can construct a, a surface whether it is safe or whether whether our data points or the stress values fall inside the surface or outside the surface. That is the idea. A failure surface can be either a yield surface or a fracture surface. So we now look at something called maximum normal stress fracture criterion, okay, which is uh, mostly applicable to metals and ceramics. Okay. So to simplify the discussion, let us assume for the present that we have a material which fractures if an ultimate strength sigma u is exceeded in either tension or compression. That is, we are temporarily assuming that sigma ut is equal to mod of sigma uc is equal to sigma u, where sigma ut is the ultimate strength in tension and the mod of sigma uc is the ultimate strength in compression expressed as a positive value. So here the criterion that is the maximum normal stress fracture criterion assumes and predicts that this critical stress is ultimate strength in tension or compression. Okay. So you should not reach uh, UC or UT, otherwise the material will fail. So that is the criterion. For such a material, the maximum normal stress fracture criterion could be, uh, uh, would be specified by a function f as follows. Sigma u is equal to max function of sigma mod 1 mod uh, sigma I mean mod sigma 2 mod sigma 3 at fracture. So either one of them or it is a combination of them where the notation max indicates that the largest of the values separated by commas is chosen. Any one of them also could be chosen. Absolute values are used so that compressive principle stresses can be considered. Please understand that we are now talking about principle normal stress. You know now the meaning of principle normal stress. We are not talking about a shear stress here. A particular set of applied stresses can then be characterized by the effective stress. Okay. So what is effective stress? We are now talking about sigma bar n is equal to max as a function of mod sigma 1, mod sigma 2, mod sigma 3, any one of this where the subscript specifies the maximum normal stress criterion. So, so capital N denotes the normal stress criterion. Okay. 
Hence, the fracture is expected when sigma n bar is equal to sigma u, but not when it is less. And the safety factor against the factor you can give x is equal to sigma u divided by sigma n bar. So, suppose if the safety factor is known like this, then we have a safe limit by which you can allow the material to take up the load or stress. So, that is the idea before it fractures. So then the next point is uh, maximum shear stress yield criterion. We have now seen maximum normal stress fracture criterion. So that name itself tells that we are now predicting the fracture. That means the material is not supposed to yield or the other way is the material uh, it is a criterion for brittle materials, for example, ceramics. That's why I said very hard metals and uh, brittle materials like ceramics and composites. The, the maximum normal principal stress criteria, fracture criterion will be valid. But now we are talking about maximum shear stress yield criterion. So the name itself suggests that yielding of ductile materials often predicted to occur when the maximum shear stress on any plane reaches the critical value tau naught, which is a material property. So tau naught is equal to tau max at yielding. So for a ductile material, we are now talking about a shear stress yield criterion. And uh, what we are talking here, the maximum shear stress on any plane reaches a critical value tau naught. So now you should recall, we looked at uh, the shear stress, uh, I mean, we resolved the total stress into normal stress and shear stress in the theory of elasticity um, lectures. And then we also looked at uh, the these shear stresses are maximum only at certain planes. That planes also we have shown, okay, how it uh, bisects the uh, normal principal axis stress, ax, I mean the planes or uh, axis and so on. I will uh, bring back that slide to uh, recall those concepts, what we have seen. But before that, we'll, let us see what this criterion says. This is the basis of the maximum shear stress yield criterion, also often called the Tresca criterion. Okay. For metals, such an approach is logical because the mechanism of yielding on a microscopic size scale is the slip of crystal planes, which is a shear deformation that is expected to be controlled by a shear stress. So uh, we are repeating the same concept that plastic deformation is caused by a shear stress that we have already shown. And, uh, and this is exactly uh, every, you know, uh, crystal planes will experience the shear deformation when they are subjected to um, tensile loading or compression loading, etc. So recall that the maximum shear stress is the largest of the three principal shear stresses which act on planes oriented at 45 degree relative to principal normal stress axis. This is what just I mentioned. So we know the three principal shear stresses, tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, we have uh, looked at it. So that's what it is. These principal shear stresses may be considered, okay, which are uh, obtained from principal normal stresses, which is repeated here for the convenience. Tau 1 is equal to mod of sigma 2 minus sigma 3 by 2, tau 2 mod of sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2, tau 3 mod of sigma 1 minus sigma 2 by 2. So now you should uh, recall out of these three, which one is the maximum? That also you know, right? Out of these three, which one is maximum? That also we have seen. And how it can be resolved from the uh, principal normal stresses? That also we have seen. We will recollect all of them as we proceed. Hence, this yield criterion can be stated as follows. So now we are now talking about yield criterion. So tau naught we have to define. 
tau naught is equal to max times mod sigma 1 minus sigma 2 by 2 like what we have seen in the the normal principle fracture criterion here we are putting the tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 at yielding whenever this tau naught reaches or it reaches the maximum of any one of these shear stresses the material will yield that is the criterion the yield stresses um, shear tau naught for a given material could be obtained directly from the from a test in simple shear such as a thin walled tube in torsion either we can obtain this quantity by simple torsion test or even a simple tensile test we can take we can relate because we have the relation right we will see what is that however only a uniaxial yield strength sigma naught from a tension test are commonly available so that it is more convenient to calculate tau naught from sigma naught okay in a uniaxial test at the stress defined at the yield strength we have sigma 1 is equal to sigma naught sigma 2 and sigma 3 is zero because it is uniaxial substitution of these values into the yield criterion above uh, the equation gives tau naught is equal to sigma naught by 2 so if you substitute this into this equation these relations so finally you get tau naught is equal to sigma naught by 2 this is the yield criterion for the tactile materials or truss car yield criterion according to the convention sigma 1 is the algebraically greatest principal stress and sigma 3 is the algebraically smallest principal uh, principal stress right tau 2 has the largest value of shear stress and it is called the maximum shear stress tau max this also we have already seen just for convenience we are rewriting here tau max is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 okay so this is uh, I, this is what i just said i will bring this three uh, i mean uh, the maximum shear stress planes which we have already seen okay if you look at this uh, uh, tau 3 and tau 2 and tau 1 these are all the exact uh, planes on which these uh, shear stress will act and this is the corresponding uh, equations which uh, relates the normal stresses and then you clearly see that the tau max is equal to tau 2 which is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 this is this is exactly uh, the yield criterion also predicts so when this max uh, reaches the material reaches the tau max of this value then it will start yielding 